Chapter 31 The X-33 space plane roared into the sky and arched south toward Rome. On board, Langdon sat in silence. The last fifteen minutes had been a blur. Now that he had finished briefing Vittoria on the Illuminati and their covenant against the Vatican, the scope of this situation was starting to sink in. What the hell am I doing? Langdon wondered. I should have gone home when I had the chance. Deep down, though, he knew he'd never had the chance. Langdon's better judgment had screamed at him to return to Boston. Nonetheless, academic astonishment had somehow vetoed prudence. Everything he had ever believed about the demise of the Illuminati was suddenly looking like a brilliant sham. Part of him craved proof. Confirmation. There was also a question of conscience. With Kohler Ailing and Vittoria on her own, Langdon knew that if his knowledge of the Illuminati could assist in any way, he had a moral obligation to be here. There was more, though. Although Langdon was ashamed to admit it, his initial horror on hearing about the antimatter's location was not only the danger to human life in Vatican City, but for something else as well. Art The world's largest art collection was now sitting on a time bomb. The Vatican Museum housed over 60,000 priceless pieces in 1,407 rooms. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Bernini, Botticelli. Langdon wondered if all of the art could possibly be evacuated if necessary. He knew it was impossible. Many of the pieces were sculptures weighing tons. Not to mention, the greatest treasures were architectural, the Sistine Chapel, St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo's famed spiral staircase leading to the Museo Vaticano, priceless testaments to man's creative genius. Langdon wondered how much time was left on the canister. Thanks for coming, Vittoria said, her voice quiet. Langdon emerged from his daydream and looked up. Vittoria was sitting across the aisle. Even in the stark fluorescent light of the cabin, there was an aura of composure about her, an almost magnetic radiance of wholeness. Her breathing seemed deeper now, as if a spark of self-preservation had ignited within her, a craving for justice and retribution fueled by a daughter's love. Vittoria had not had time to change from her shorts and sleeveless top, and her tawny legs were now goose-bumped in the cold of the plane. Instinctively, Langdon removed his jacket and offered it to her. American chivalry? She accepted, her eyes thanking him silently. The plane jostled across some turbulence, and Langdon felt a surge of danger. The windowless cabin felt cramped again, and he tried to imagine himself in an open field. The notion, he realized, was ironic. He had been in an open field when it had happened. Crushing darkness. He pushed the memory from his mind. Ancient history. Vittoria was watching him. Do you believe in God, Mr. Langdon? The question startled him. The earnestness in Vittoria's voice was even more disarming than the inquiry. Do I believe in God? He had hoped for a lighter topic of conversation to pass the trip. A spiritual conundrum, Langdon thought. That's what my friends call me. Although he studied religion for years, Langdon was not a religious man. He respected the power of faith, the benevolence of churches, the strength religion gave so many people. And yet, for him, the intellectual suspension of disbelief that was imperative if one were truly going to believe, had always proved too big an obstacle for his academic mind. I want to believe, he heard himself say. Vittoria's reply carried no judgment or challenge. So why don't you? He chuckled. Well, it's not that easy. Having faith requires leaps of faith, cerebral acceptance of miracles, immaculate conceptions, and divine interventions. And then, there are the codes of conduct. The Bible, the Quran, Buddhist scripture, they all carry similar requirements and similar penalties. They claim that if I don't live by a specific code, I will go to hell. I can't imagine a god who would rule that way. 
I hope you don't let your students dodge questions that shamelessly. The comment caught him off guard. What? Mr. Langdon, I did not ask if you believe what man says about God. I asked if you believe in God. There is a difference. Holy Scripture is stories. Legends and history of man's quest to understand his own need for meaning. I am not asking you to pass judgment on literature. I am asking if you believe in God. When you lie out under the stars, do you sense the divine? Do you feel in your gut that you are staring up at the work of God's hand? Langdon took a long moment to consider it. I'm prying, Vittoria apologized. No, I just... Certainly you must debate issues of faith with your classes. Endlessly. And you play devil's advocate, I imagine. Always fueling the debate. Langdon smiled. You must be a teacher, too. No, but I learned from a master. My father could argue two sides of a Mobius strip. Langdon laughed, picturing the artful crafting of a Mobius strip, a twisted ring of paper, which technically possessed only one side. Langdon had first seen the single-sided shape in the artwork of M. C. Escher. May I ask you a question, Ms. Vetra? Call me Vittoria. Ms. Vetra makes me feel old. He sighed inwardly, suddenly sensing his own age. Vittoria, I'm Robert. You had a question. Yes. As a scientist and the daughter of a Catholic priest, what do you think of religion? Vittoria paused, brushing a lock of hair from her eyes. Religion is like language or dress. We gravitate toward the practices with which we were raised. In the end, though, we are all proclaiming the same thing. That life has meaning. That we are grateful for the power that created us. Langdon was intrigued. So you're saying that whether you are a Christian or a Muslim simply depends on where you were born? Isn't it obvious? Look at the diffusion of religion around the globe. So faith is random? Hardly. Faith is universal. Our specific methods for understanding it are arbitrary. Some of us pray to Jesus. Some of us go to Mecca. Some of us study subatomic particles. In the end, we are all just searching for truth, that which is greater than ourselves. Langdon wished his students could express themselves so clearly. Hell, he wished he could express himself so clearly. And God? he asked. Do you believe in God? Victoria was silent for a long time. Science tells me God must exist. My mind tells me I will never understand God. And my heart tells me I am not meant to. How is that for concise, he thought. So you believe God is fact, but we will never understand him. Her, she said with a smile. Your Native Americans had it right. Langdon chuckled. Mother Earth. Gia. The planet is an organism. All of us are cells with different purposes. And yet we are intertwined. Serving each other. Serving the whole. Looking at her, Langdon felt something stir within him that he had not felt in a long time. There was a bewitching clarity in her eyes. A purity in her voice. He felt drawn. Mr. Langdon, let me ask you another question. Robert, he said, Mr. Langdon makes me feel old. I am old. If you don't mind my asking, Robert, how did you get involved with the Illuminati? Langdon thought back. Actually, it was money. Vittoria looked disappointed. Money? Consulting, you mean? Langdon laughed, realizing how it must have sounded. No. Money as in currency. He reached in his pants pocket and pulled out some money. He found a one dollar bill. I became fascinated with the cult when I first learned that U.S. currency is covered with Illuminati symbology. Vittoria's eyes narrowed, apparently not knowing whether or not to take him seriously. Langdon handed her the bill. Look at the back. See the great seal on the left? Vittoria turned the one-dollar bill over. You mean the pyramid? The pyramid? 
Do you know what pyramids have to do with U.S. history? Vittoria shrugged. Exactly, Langdon said. Absolutely nothing. Vittoria frowned. So why is it the central symbol of your great seal? An eerie bit of history, Langdon said. The pyramid is an occult symbol representing a convergence upward toward the ultimate source of illumination. See what's above it. Vittoria studied the bill. An eye inside a triangle. It's called the Trinacria. Have you ever seen that eye in a triangle anywhere else? Vittoria was silent a moment. Actually, yes, but I'm not sure. It's emblazoned on Masonic lodges around the world. The symbol is Masonic? Actually, no. It's Illuminati. They called it their shining delta. A call for enlightened change. The eye signifies the Illuminati's ability to infiltrate and watch all things. The shining triangle represents enlightenment. And the triangle is also the Greek letter delta, which is the mathematical symbol for change. Transition. Langdon smiled. I forgot I was talking to a scientist. So you're saying the U.S.? Great Seal is a call for enlightened, all-seeing change. Some would call it a new world order. Vittoria seemed startled. She glanced down at the bill again. The writing under the pyramid says novice. Ordo. Novice Ordo Seculorum, Langdon said. It means new secular order. Secular as in non-religious? Non-religious. The phrase not only clearly states the Illuminati objective, but it also blatantly contradicts the phrase beside it. In God we trust. Vittoria seemed troubled. But how could all this symbology end up on the most powerful currency in the world? Most academics believe it was through Vice President Henry Wallace. He was an upper echelon mason and certainly had ties to the Illuminati. Whether it was as a member or innocently under their influence, nobody knows. But it was Wallace who sold the design of the Great Seal to the President. How? Why would the President have agreed to? The President was Franklin D. Roosevelt. Wallace simply told him Novus Ordo Seculorum meant New Deal. Vittoria seemed skeptical. And Roosevelt didn't have anyone else look at the symbol before telling the Treasury to print it. No need. He and Wallace were like brothers. Brothers? Check your history books, Langdon said with a smile. Franklin D. Roosevelt was a well-known mason. Chapter 32 Langdon held his breath as the X-33 spiraled into Rome's Leonardo da Vinci International Airport. Vittoria sat across from him, eyes closed, as if trying to will the situation into control. The craft touched down and taxied to a private hangar. Sorry for the slow flight. The pilot apologized, emerging from the cockpit. Had to trim her back. Noise regulations over populated areas. Langdon checked his watch. They had been airborne 37 minutes. The pilot popped the outer door. Anybody want to tell me what's going on? Neither Vittoria nor Langdon responded. Fine, he said, stretching. I'll be in the cockpit with the air conditioning and my music. Just me and Garth. The late afternoon sun blazed outside the hangar. Langdon carried his tweed jacket over his shoulder. Vittoria turned her face skyward and inhaled deeply as if the sun's rays somehow transferred to her some mystical replenishing energy. Mediterraneans, Langdon mused, already sweating. Little old for cartoons, aren't you? Vittoria asked, without opening her eyes. I'm sorry. Your wristwatch. I saw it on the plane. Langdon flushed slightly. He was accustomed to having to defend his timepiece. The collector's edition Mickey Mouse watch had been a childhood gift from his parents. Despite the contorted foolishness of Mickey's outstretched arms designating the hour, it was the only watch Langdon had ever worn. Waterproof and glow-in-the-dark, 
It was perfect for swimming laps or walking unlit college paths at night. When Langdon's students questioned his fashion sense, he told them he wore Mickey as a daily reminder to stay young at heart. It's six o'clock, he said. Victoria nodded, eyes still closed. I think our ride's here. Langdon heard the distant whine, looked up, and felt a sinking feeling. Approaching from the north was a helicopter, slicing low across the runway. Langdon had been on a helicopter once in the Andean Palpa Valley looking at the Nazca sand drawings and had not enjoyed it one bit. A flying shoebox. After a morning of space plane riots, Langdon had hoped the Vatican would send a car. Apparently not. The chopper slowed overhead, hovered a moment, and dropped toward the runway in front of him. The craft was white and carried a coat of arms emblazoned on the side, two skeleton keys crossing a shield and papal crown. He knew the symbol well. It was the traditional seal of the Vatican, the sacred symbol of the Holy See or Holy Seat of Government, the seat being literally the ancient throne of St. Peter. The Holy Chopper, Langdon groaned, watching the craft land. He'd forgotten the Vatican owned one of these things, used for transporting the Pope to the airport, to meetings, or to his summer palace in Gondolfo. Langdon definitely would have preferred a car. The pilot jumped from the cockpit and strode toward them across the tarmac. Now it was Vittoria who looked uneasy. That's our pilot? Langdon shared her concern. To fly or not to fly? That is the question. The pilot looked like he was festooned for a Shakespearean melodrama. His puffy tunic was vertically striped in brilliant blue and gold. He wore matching pantaloons and spats. On his feet were black flats that looked like slippers. On top of it all, he wore a black felt beret. Traditional Swiss Guard uniforms, Langdon explained. Designed by Michelangelo himself. As the man drew closer, Langdon winced. I admit, not one of Michelangelo's better efforts. Despite the man's garish attire, Langdon could tell the pilot meant business. He moved toward them with all the rigidity and dignity of a U.S. Marine. Langdon had read many times about the rigorous requirements for becoming one of the elite Swiss Guard. Recruited from one of Switzerland's four Catholic cantons, applicants had to be Swiss males between 19 and 30 years old, at least 5 feet 6 inches, trained by the Swiss Army and unmarried. This imperial corps was envied by world governments, as the most allegiant and deadly security force in the world. You are from CERN? The guard asked, arriving before them. His voice was steely. Yes, sir, Langdon replied. You made remarkable time, he said, giving the X-33 a mystified stare. He turned to Vittoria. Ma'am, do you have any other clothing? I beg your pardon? He motioned to her legs. Short pants are not permitted inside Vatican City. Langdon glanced down at Vittoria's legs and frowned. He had forgotten. Vatican City had a strict ban on visible legs above the knee, both male and female. The regulation was a way of showing respect for the sanctity of God's city. This is all I have, she said. We came in a hurry. The guard nodded, clearly displeased. He turned next to Langdon. Are you carrying any weapons? Weapons, Langdon thought. I'm not even carrying a change of underwear. He shook his head. The officer crouched at Langdon's feet and began patting him down, starting at his socks. Trusting guy, Langdon thought. The guard's strong hands moved up Langdon's legs, coming uncomfortably close to his groin. Finally, they moved up to his chest and shoulders. Apparently content Langdon was clean, the guard turned to Vittoria. He ran his eyes up her legs and torso. Vittoria glared. Don't even think about it. The guard fixed Vittoria with a gaze clearly intended to intimidate. Vittoria did not flinch. What's that? 
the guard said, pointing to a faint square bulge in the front pocket of her shorts. Vittoria removed an ultra-thin cell phone. The guard took it, clicked it on, waited for a dial tone, and then, apparently satisfied that it was indeed nothing more than a phone, returned it to her. Vittoria slid it back into her pocket. Turn around, please, the guard said. Vittoria obliged, holding her arms out and rotating a full 360 degrees. The guard carefully studied her. Langdon had already decided that Vittoria's form-fitting shorts and blouse were not bulging anywhere they shouldn't have been. Apparently, the guard came to the same conclusion. Thank you. This way, please. The Swiss guard chopper churned in neutral as Langdon and Vittoria approached. Vittoria boarded first, like a seasoned pro, barely even stooping as she passed beneath the whirling rotors. Langdon held back a moment. No chance of a car, he yelled, half-joking to the Swiss guard, who was climbing in the pilot's seat. The man did not answer. Langdon knew that with Rome's maniacal drivers, flying was probably safer anyway. He took a deep breath and boarded, stooping cautiously as he passed beneath the spinning rotors. As the guard fired up the engines, Vittoria called out, Have you located the canister? The guard glanced over his shoulder, looking confused. The what? The canister. You called, sir, about a canister? The man shrugged. No idea what you're talking about. We've been very busy today. My commander told me to pick you up. That's all I know. Vittoria gave Langdon an unsettled look. Buckle up, please, the pilot said as the engine revved. Langdon reached for his seat belt and strapped himself in. The tiny fuselage seemed to shrink around him. Then with a roar, the craft shot up and banked, sharply north toward Rome. Rome, the cap at Mundi, where Caesar once ruled, where St. Peter was crucified, the cradle of modern civilization, and at its core, a ticking bomb. Chapter 33 Rome from the air is a labyrinth, an indecipherable maze of ancient roadways winding around buildings, fountains, and crumbling ruins. The Vatican chopper stayed low in the sky as it sliced northwest through the permanent smog layer coughed up by the congestion below. Langdon gazed down at the mopeds, sightseeing buses, and armies of miniature Fiat sedans buzzing around rotaries in all directions. Quedescazzi, he thought, recalling the Hopi term for life out of balance. Vittoria sat in silent determination in the seat beside him. The chopper banked hard. His stomach dropping, Langdon gazed farther into the distance. His eyes found the crumbling ruins of the Roman Colosseum. The Colosseum, Langdon had always thought, was one of history's greatest ironies. Now a dignified symbol for the rise of human culture and civilization, the stadium had been built to host centuries of barbaric events, hungry lions shredding prisoners, armies of slaves battling to the death, gang rapes of exotic women captured from far-off lands, as well as public beheadings and castrations. It was ironic, Langdon thought, or perhaps fitting, that the Colosseum had served as the architectural blueprint for Harvard Soldier Field, the football stadium where the ancient traditions of savagery were reenacted every fall, crazed fans screaming for bloodshed as Harvard battled Yale. As the chopper headed north, Langdon spied the Roman Forum, the heart of pre-Christian Rome. The decaying columns looked like toppled gravestones in a cemetery that had somehow avoided being swallowed by the metropolis surrounding it. To the west, the wide basin of the Tiber River wound enormous arcs across the city. Even from the air, Langdon could tell the water was deep. The churning currents were brown, filled with silt and foam from heavy rains. Straight ahead, the pilot said, climbing higher. Langdon and Vittoria looked out and saw it. Like a mountain parting the morning fog, the colossal dome rose out of the haze before them, St. Peter's Basilica. 
Now that, Langdon said to Vittoria, is something Michelangelo got right. Langdon had never seen St. Peter's from the air. The marble facade blazed like fire in the afternoon sun. Adorned with 140 statues of saints, martyrs, and angels, the Herculean edifice stretched two football fields wide and a staggering six long. The cavernous interior of the basilica had room for over 60,000 worshippers, over 100 times the population of Vatican City, the smallest country in the world. Incredibly, though, not even a citadel of this magnitude could dwarf the piazza before it. A sprawling expanse of granite, St. Peter's Square was a staggering open space in the congestion of Rome, like a classical central park. In front of the basilica, bordering the vast oval common, 284 columns swept outward in four concentric arcs of diminishing size and architectural tromp. De Eloil used to heighten the piazza's sense of grandeur. As he stared at the magnificent shrine before him, Langdon wondered what St. Peter would think if he were here now. The saint had died a gruesome death, crucified upside down on this very spot. Now he rested in the most sacred of tombs, buried five stories down, directly beneath the central cupola of the basilica. Vatican City, the pilot said, sounding anything but welcoming. Langdon looked out at the towering stone bastions that loomed ahead, impenetrable fortifications surrounding the complex, a strangely earthly defense for a spiritual world of secrets, power, and mystery. Look, Vittoria said suddenly, grabbing Langdon's arm. She motioned frantically downward toward St. Peter's Square, directly beneath them. Langdon put his face to the window and looked. Over there, she said, pointing. Langdon looked. The rear of the piazza looked like a parking lot crowded with a dozen or so trailer trucks. Huge satellite dishes pointed skyward from the roof of every truck. The dishes were emblazoned with familiar names. Televisor Europea. Video Italia. BBC. United Press International. Langdon felt suddenly confused, wondering if the news of the antimatter had already leaked out. Vittoria seemed suddenly tense. Why is the press here? What's going on? The pilot turned and gave her an odd look over his shoulder. What's going on? You don't know? No, she fired back, her accent husky and strong. I'll come, Clavo, he said. It is to be sealed in about an hour. The whole world is watching. I'll come, Clavo. The word rang a long moment in Langdon's ears before dropping like a brick to the pit of his stomach. Il Conclavo. The Vatican Conclave. How could he have forgotten? It had been in the news recently. Fifteen days ago, the Pope, after a tremendously popular twelve-year reign, had passed away. Every paper in the world had carried the story about the Pope's fatal stroke while sleeping. A sudden and unexpected death many whispered was suspicious. But now, in keeping with the sacred tradition, fifteen days after the death of a pope, the Vatican was holding Il Conclavo, the sacred ceremony in which the 165 cardinals of the world, the most powerful men in Christendom, gathered in Vatican City to elect the new pope. Every cardinal on the planet is here today, Langdon thought as the chopper passed over St. Peter's Basilica. The expansive inner world of Vatican City spread out beneath him. The entire power structure of the Roman Catholic Church is sitting on a time bomb. Chapter 34 Cardinal Mortati gazed up at the lavish ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and tried to find a moment of quiet reflection. The frescoed walls echoed with the voices of cardinals from nations around the globe. The men jostled in the candlelit tabernacle, whispering excitedly and consulting with one another in numerous languages, the universal tongues being English, Italian, and Spanish. The light in the chapel was usually sublime, long rays of tinted sun slicing through the darkness, like rays from heaven, but not today. As was the custom, 
All of the chapel's windows had been covered in black velvet in the name of secrecy. This ensured that no one on the inside could send signals or communicate in any way with the outside world. The result was a profound darkness lit only by candles, a shimmering radiance that seemed to purify everyone it touched, making them all ghostly, like saints. What privilege, Mortati thought, that I am to oversee this sanctified event. Cardinals over 80 years of age were too old to be eligible for election and did not attend conclave. But at 79 years old, Mortati was the most senior cardinal here and had been appointed to oversee the proceedings. Following tradition, the cardinals gathered here two hours before conclave to catch up with friends and engage in last-minute discussion. At 7 p.m. the late, Pope's Chamberlain would arrive, give opening prayer, and then leave. Then, the Swiss guard would seal the doors and lock all the cardinals inside. It was then that the oldest and most secret of political ritual in the world would begin. The cardinals would not be released until they decided who among them would be the next pope. Conclave. Even the name was secretive. Conclave literally meant locked with a key. The cardinals were permitted no contact whatsoever with the outside world. No phone calls. No messages. No whispers through doorways. Conclave was a vacuum, not to be influenced by anything in the outside world. This would ensure that the cardinals kept solemn dumb prey oculis, only God before their eyes. Outside the walls of the chapel, of course, the media watched and waited, speculating as to which of the cardinals would become the ruler of one billion Catholics worldwide. Conclaves created an intense, politically charged atmosphere, and over the centuries they had turned deadly. Poisonings, fist fights, and even murder had erupted within the sacred walls. Ancient history, Mortati thought. Tonight's conclave will be unified, blissful, and above all, brief. Or at least that had been his speculation. Now, however, an unexpected development had emerged. Mystifyingly, for cardinals were absent from the chapel. Mortati knew that all the exits to Vatican City were guarded, and the missing cardinals could not have gone far, but still, with less than an hour before opening prayer, he was feeling disconcerted. After all, the four missing men were no ordinary cardinals. They were the cardinals. The chosen four. As overseer of the conclave, Mortati had already sent word through the proper channels to the Swiss guard alerting them to the cardinal's absence. He had yet to hear back. Other cardinals had now noticed the puzzling absence. The anxious whispers had begun. Of all cardinals, these four should be on time. Cardinal Mortati was starting to fear it might be a long evening after all. He had no idea. Chapter 35 The Vatican Telepad for reasons of safety and noise control, is located in the northwest tip of Vatican City, as far from St. Peter's Basilica as possible. Terra firma, the pilot announced as they touched down. He exited and opened the sliding door for Langdon and Vittoria. Langdon descended from the craft and turned to help Vittoria, but she had already dropped effortlessly to the ground. Every muscle in her body seemed tuned to one objective finding the antimatter before it left a horrific legacy. After stretching a reflective sun tarp across the cockpit window, the pilot ushered them to an oversized electric golf cart waiting near the helipad. The cart whisked them silently alongside the country's western border, a 50-foot-tall cement bulwark thick enough to ward off attacks even by tanks. Lining the interior of the wall, posted at 50-meter intervals, Swiss guards stood at attention, surveying the interior of the grounds. The cart turned sharply right. Onto Via della Osservatorio. Signs pointed in all directions. Palazzo Governatorio. Collegio Ethiopiana. Basilica San Pietro. Capella Sistina. They accelerated up the manicured road past a squat building marked Radio Vaticana. This 
Langdon realized to his amazement, was the hub of the world's most listened to radio programming, Radio Vaticana, spreading the word of God to millions of listeners around the globe. Attenzione, the pilot said, turning sharply into a rotary. As the cart wound round, Langdon could barely believe the sight now coming into view. Giardini Vaticani, he thought. The heart of Vatican City. Directly ahead rose the rear of St. Peter's Basilica, a view, Langdon realized, most people never saw. To the right loomed the palace of the tribunal, the lush papal residence, rivaled only by Versailles in its Baroque embellishment. The severe-looking Governatorato building was now behind them, housing Vatican City's administration. And up ahead on the left, the massive rectangular edifice of the Vatican Museum. Langdon knew there would be no time for a museum visit this trip. Where is everyone? Vittoria asked, surveying the deserted lawns and walkways. The guard checked his black, military-style chronograph, an odd anachronism beneath his puffy sleeve. The cardinals are convened in the Sistine Chapel. Conclave begins in a little under an hour. Langdon nodded, vaguely recalling that before Conclave the cardinals spent two hours inside the Sistine Chapel in quiet reflection and visitations with their fellow cardinals from around the globe. The time was meant to renew old friendships among the cardinals and facilitate a less heated election process. And the rest of the residents and staff? Banned from the city for secrecy and security until the conclave concludes. And when does it conclude? The guard shrugged. God only knows. The word sounded oddly literal. After parking the cart on the wide lawn directly behind St. Peter's Basilica, the guard escorted Langdon and Vittoria up a stone escarpment to a marble plaza off the back of the basilica. Crossing the plaza, they approached the rear wall of the basilica and followed it through a triangular courtyard, across Via Belvedere, and into a series of buildings closely huddled together. Langdon's art history had taught him enough Italian to pick out signs for the Vatican Printing Office, the Tapestry Restoration Lab, Post Office Management, and the Church of St. Anne. They crossed another small square and arrived at their destination. The office of the Swiss Guard is housed adjacent to Il Corpo di Vigilanza, directly northeast of St. Peter's Basilica. The office is a squat, stone building. On either side of the entrance, like two stone statues, stood a pair of guards. Langdon had to admit, these guards did not look quite so comical. Although they also wore the blue and gold uniform, each wielded the traditional Vatican long sword, an eight-foot spear with a razor-sharp scythe, rumored to have decapitated countless Muslims while defending the Christian crusaders in the 15th century. As Langdon and Vittoria approached, the two guards stepped forward, crossing their long swords, blocking the entrance. One looked up at the pilot in confusion. I pantaloni, he said, motioning to Vittoria's shorts. The pilot waved them off. I'll commandante vol veterly subito. The guards frowned. Reluctantly, they stepped aside. Inside, the air was cool. It looked nothing like the administrative security offices Langdon would have imagined. Ornate and impeccably furnished, the hallways contained paintings Langdon was certain any museum worldwide would gladly have featured in its main gallery. The pilot pointed down a steep set of stairs. Down, please! Langdon and Vittoria followed the white marble treads as they descended between a gauntlet of nude male sculptures. Each statue wore a fig leaf that was lighter in color than the rest of the body. The Great Castration, Langdon thought. It was one of the most horrific tragedies in Renaissance art. In 1857, Pope Pius IX decided that the accurate representation of the male form might incite lust inside the Vatican. So he got a chisel and mallet and hacked off the genitalia of every single male statue inside Vatican City. He defaced works by Michelangelo, Bramante, and Bernini. 
plaster fig leaves were used to patch the damage. Hundreds of sculptures had been emasculated. Langdon had often wondered if there was a huge crate of stone penises someplace. Here, the guard announced. They reached the bottom of the stairs and dead-ended at a heavy, steel door. The guard typed an entry code, and the door slid open. Langdon and Victoria entered. Beyond the threshold was absolute mayhem. Chapter 36 The Office of the Swiss Guard Langdon stood in the doorway, surveying the collision of centuries before them. Mixed media. The room was a lushly adorned Renaissance library complete with inlaid bookshelves, oriental carpets, and colorful tapestries, and yet the room bristled with high-tech gear, banks of computers, faxes, electronic maps of the Vatican complex, and televisions tuned to CNN. Men in colorful pantaloons typed feverishly on computers and listened intently in futuristic headphones. Wait here, the guard said. Langdon and Vittoria waited as the guard crossed the room to an exceptionally tall, wiry man in a dark blue military uniform. He was talking on a cellular phone and stood so straight he was almost bent backward. The guard said something to him, and the man shot a glance over at Langdon and Vittoria. He nodded, then turned his back on them and continued his phone call. The guard returned. Commander Olivetti will be with you in a moment. Thank you. The guard left and headed back up the stairs. Langdon studied Commander Olivetti across the room, realizing he was actually the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of an entire country. Vittoria and Langdon waited, observing the action before them. Brightly dressed guards bustled about yelling orders in Italian. Continua circando! One yelled into a telephone. Probasti al Musio? Another asked. Langdon did not need fluent Italian to discern that the security center was currently in intense search mode. This was the good news. The bad news was that they obviously had not yet found the antimatter. You okay? Langdon asked Vittoria. She shrugged, offering a tired smile. When the commander finally clicked off his phone and approached across the room, he seemed to grow with each step. Langdon was tall himself and not accustomed to looking up at many people, but Commander Olivetti demanded it. Langdon sensed immediately that the commander was a man who had weathered tempests, his face hale and steeled. His dark hair was cropped in a military buzz cut and his eyes burned with a kind of hardened determination only attainable through years of intense training. He moved with ramrod exactness, the earpiece hidden discreetly behind one ear making him look more like U.S. Secret Service than Swiss Guard. The commander addressed them in accented English. His voice was startlingly quiet for such a large man, barely a whisper. It bit with a tight, military efficiency. Good afternoon. He said, I am Commander Olivetti, Commandante Principali of the Swiss Guard. I'm the one who called your director. Vittoria gazed upward. Thank you for seeing us, sir. The commander did not respond. He motioned for them to follow and led them through the tangle of electronics to a door in the side wall of the chamber. Enter, he said, holding the door for them. Langdon and Vittoria walked through and found themselves in a darkened control room where a wall of video monitors was cycling lazily through a series of black and white images of the complex. A young guard sat watching the images intently. Fury, Olivetti said. The guard packed up and left. Olivetti walked over to one of the screens and pointed to it. Then he turned toward his guests. This image is from a remote camera hidden somewhere inside Vatican City. I'd like an explanation. Langdon and Vittoria looked at the screen and inhaled in unison. The image was absolute. No doubt. It was CERN's antimatter canister. Inside, a shimmering droplet of metallic liquid hung ominously in the air, 
lit by the rhythmic blinking of the LED digital clock. Eerily, the area around the canister was almost entirely dark, as if the antimatter were in a closet or darkened room. At the top of the monitor flashed superimposed text, live feed, camera number 86. Vittoria looked at the time remaining on the flashing indicator on the canister. Under six hours, she whispered to Langdon, her face tense. Langdon checked his watch. So we have until... He stopped, a knot tightening in his stomach. Midnight, Vittoria said, with a withering look. Midnight, Langdon thought. A flare for the dramatic. Apparently whoever stole the canister last night had timed it perfectly. A stark foreboding set in as he realized he was currently sitting at ground zero. Olivetti's whisper now sounded more like a hiss. Does this object belong to your facility? Vittoria nodded. Yes, sir. It was stolen from us. It contains an extremely combustible substance called antimatter. Olivetti looked unmoved. I am quite familiar with incendiaries, Ms. Vetra. I have not heard of antimatter. It's new technology. We need to locate it immediately or evacuate Vatican City. Olivetti closed his eyes slowly and reopened them, as if refocusing on Vittoria might change what he just heard. Evacuate? Are you aware what is going on here this evening? Yes, sir and the lives of your cardinals are in danger. We have about six hours. Have you made any headway locating the canister? Olivetti shook his head. We haven't started looking. Vittoria choked. What? But we expressly heard your guards talking about searching them. Searching, yes, Olivetti said, but not for your canister. My men are looking for something else that does not concern you. Vittoria's voice cracked. You haven't even begun looking for this canister? Olivetti's pupils seemed to recede into his head. He had the passionless look of an insect. Miss Vetra, is it? Let me explain something to you. The director of your facility refused to share any details about this object with me over the phone except to say that I needed to find it immediately. We are exceptionally busy and I do not have the luxury of dedicating manpower to a situation until I get some facts. There is only one relevant fact at this moment, sir, Vittoria said, that being that in six hours, the device is going to vaporize this entire complex. Olivetti stood motionless. Miss Vetra, there is something you need to know. His tone hinted at patronizing. Despite the archaic appearance of Vatican City, Every single entrance, both public and private, is equipped with the most advanced sensing equipment known to man. If someone tried to enter with any sort of incendiary device, it would be detected instantly. We have radioactive isotope scanners, olfactory filters designed by the American DA to detect the faintest chemical signatures of combustibles and toxins. We also use the most advanced metal detectors and X-ray scanners available. Very impressive, Vittoria said, matching Olivetti's cool. Unfortunately, antimatter is non-radioactive. Its chemical signature is that of pure hydrogen, and the canister is plastic. None of those devices would have detected it. But the device has an energy source, Olivetti said, motioning to the blinking LED. Even the smallest trace of nickel cadmium would register as. The batteries are also plastic. Olivetti's patience was clearly starting to wane. Plastic batteries? Polymer gel electrolyte with Teflon. Olivetti leaned toward her, as if to accentuate his height advantage. Signorina, the Vatican is the target of dozens of bomb threats a month. I personally train every Swiss guard in modern explosive technology. I am well aware that there is no substance on Earth powerful enough to do what you are describing unless you are talking about a nuclear warhead with a fuel core the size of a baseball. Vittoria framed him with a fervent stare. Nature has many mysteries yet to unveil. Olivetti leaned closer. 
Might I ask exactly who you are? What is your position at CERN? I am a senior member of the research staff and appointed liaison to the Vatican for this crisis. Excuse me for being rude, but if this is indeed a crisis, why am I dealing with you and not your director? And what disrespect do you intend by coming? Into Vatican City in short pants? Langdon groaned. He couldn't believe that under the circumstances the man was being a stickler for dress code. Then again, he realized, if stone penises could induce lustful thoughts in Vatican residents, Vittoria Vetra in shorts could certainly be a threat to national security. Commander Olivetti, Langdon intervened, trying to defuse what looked like a second bomb about to explode. My name is Robert Langdon. I'm a professor of religious studies in the U.S. and unaffiliated with CERN. I have seen an antimatter demonstration and will vouch for Ms. Vetra's claim that it is exceptionally dangerous. We have reason to believe it was placed inside your complex by an anti-religious cult hoping to disrupt your conclave. Olivetti turned, peering down at Langdon. I have a woman in shorts telling me that a droplet of liquid is going to blow up Vatican City, and I have an American professor telling me we are being targeted by some anti-religious cult. What exactly is it you expect me to do? Find the canister, Vittoria said. Right away. Impossible. That device could be anywhere. Vatican City is enormous. Your cameras don't have GPS locators on them? They are not generally stolen. This missing camera will take days to locate. We don't have days, Vittoria said adamantly. We have six hours. Six hours until what, Miss Vetra? Olivetti's voice grew louder suddenly. He pointed to the image on the screen. Until these numbers count down? Until Vatican City disappears? Believe me, I do not take kindly to people tampering with my security system. Nor do I like mechanical contraptions appearing mysteriously inside my walls. I am concerned. It is my job to be concerned. But what you have told me here is unacceptable. Langdon spoke before he could stop himself. Have you heard of the Illuminati? The commander's icy exterior cracked. His eyes went white, like a shark about to attack. I am warning you. I do not have time for this. So you have heard of the Illuminati? Olivetti's eyes stabbed like bayonets. I am a sworn defendant of the Catholic Church. Of course, I have heard of the Illuminati. They have been dead for decades. Langdon reached in his pocket and pulled out the fax image of Leonardo Vetra's branded body. He handed it to Olivetti. I am an Illuminati scholar, Langdon said as Olivetti studied the picture. I am having a difficult time accepting that the Illuminati are still active, and yet the appearance of this brand combined with the fact that the Illuminati have a well-known covenant against Vatican City has changed my mind. A computer-generated hoax. Olivetti handed the facts back to Langdon. Langdon stared, incredulous. Hoax? Look at the symmetry. You of all people should realize the authenticity of Authenticity is precisely what you lack. Perhaps Ms. Vetra has not informed you, but CERN scientists have been criticizing Vatican policies for decades. They regularly petition us for retraction of creationist theory, formal apologies for Galileo and Copernicus, repeal of our criticism against dangerous or immoral research. What scenario seems more likely to you that a 400-year-old satanic cult has resurfaced with an advanced weapon of mass destruction, or that some prankster at CERN is trying to disrupt a sacred Vatican event with a well-executed fraud. That photo, Vittoria said, her voice like boiling lava, is of my father. Murdered. You think this is my idea of a joke? I don't know, Ms. Vetra, but I do know until I get some answers that make sense. There is no way I will raise any sort of alarm. Vigilance and discretion are my duty, such that spiritual matters can take place here with clarity of mind. Today of all days, Langdon said. 
At least postpone the event. Postpone? All of Eddie's jaw dropped. Such arrogance. A conclave is not some American baseball game you call on account of rain. This is a sacred event with a strict code and process. Never mind that one billion Catholics in the world are waiting for a leader. Never mind that the world media is outside. The protocols for this event are holy, not subject to modification. Since 1179, conclaves have survived earthquakes, famines, and even the plague. Believe me, it is not about to be canceled on account of a murdered scientist and a droplet of God knows what. Take me to the person in charge, Vittoria demanded. All of it he glared. You've got him. No, she said. Someone in the clergy. The veins on Olivetti's brow began to show. The clergy is gone. With the exception of the Swiss Guard, the only ones present in Vatican City at this time are the College of Cardinals. And they are inside the Sistine Chapel. How about the Chamberlain? Langdon stated flatly. Who? The late Pope's Chamberlain. Langdon repeated the word self-assuredly, praying his memory served him. He recalled reading once about the curious arrangement of Vatican authority following the death of a pope. If Langdon was correct, during the interim between popes, complete autonomous power shifted temporarily to the late pope's personal assistant, his chamberlain, a secretarial underling who oversaw conclave until the cardinals chose the new holy father. I believe the Chamberlain is the man in charge at the moment. I have Camerlingo? All of it he scowled. The Camerlingo is only a priest here. He is not even canonized. He is the late Pope's hand servant. But he is here. And you answer to him. All of it he crossed his arms. Mr. Langdon, it is true that Vatican rule dictates the Camerlingo assume chief executive office during conclave, but it is only because his lack of eligibility for the papacy ensures an unbiased election. It is as if your president died, and one of his aides temporarily sat in the Oval Office. The Camerlingo is young, and his understanding of security, or anything else for that matter, is extremely limited. For all intents and purposes, I am in charge here. Take us to him, Vittoria said. Impossible. Conclave begins in 40 minutes. The Camerlingo is in the office of the Pope preparing. I have no intention of disturbing him with matters of security. Vittoria opened her mouth to respond, but was interrupted by a knocking at the door. Olivetti opened it. A guard in full regalia stood outside, pointing to his watch. Elora, Commandante. Olivetti checked his own watch and nodded. He turned back to Langdon and Vittoria like a judge pondering their fate. Follow me. He led them out of the monitoring room across the security center to a small clear cubicle against the rear wall. My office. Olivetti ushered them inside. The room was unspecial. A cluttered desk, file cabinets, folding chairs, a water cooler. I will be back in ten minutes. I suggest you use the time to decide how you would like to proceed. Vittoria wheeled. You can't just leave. That canister is. I do not have time for this. All of it he seated. Perhaps I should detain you until after the conclave when I do have time. Signore, the guard urged, pointing to his watch again. Spazzer di Capella. Olivetti nodded and started to leave. Spazzer di Capella? Vittoria demanded. You're leaving to sweep the chapel? Olivetti turned, his eyes boring through her. We sweep for electronic bugs, Miss Vetra, a matter of discretion. He motioned to her legs. Not something I would expect you to understand. With that he slammed the door, rattling the heavy glass. In one fluid motion, he produced a key, inserted it, and twisted. A heavy deadbolt slid into place. Idiota! Vittoria yelled. You can't keep us in here! Through the glass, 
Langdon could see Olivetti say something to the guard. The sentinel nodded. As Olivetti strode out of the room, the guard spun and faced them on the other side of the glass, arms crossed, a large sidearm visible on his hip. Perfect, Langdon thought. Just bloody perfect. Chapter 37 Vittoria glared at the Swiss guard standing outside Olivetti's locked door. The sentinel glared back, his colorful costume belying his decidedly ominous air. Che fiasco, Vittoria thought, held hostage by an armed man in pajamas. Langdon had fallen silent, and Vittoria hoped he was using that harbored brain of his to think them out of this. She sensed, however, from the look on his face, that he was more in shock than in thought. She regretted getting him so involved. Vittoria's first instinct was to pull out her cell phone and call Kohler, but she knew it was foolish. First, the guard would probably walk in and take her phone. Second, if Kohler's episode ran its usual course, he was probably still incapacitated. Not that it mattered. Olivetti seemed unlikely to take anybody's word on anything at the moment. Remember, she told herself. Remember the solution to this test. Remembrance was a Buddhist philosopher's trick. Rather than asking her mind to search for a solution to a potentially impossible challenge, Vittoria asked her mind simply to remember it. The presupposition that one once knew the answer created the mindset that the answer must exist thus eliminating the crippling conception of hopelessness. Vittoria often used the process to solve scientific quandaries, those that most people thought had no solution. At the moment, however, her remembrance trick was drawing a major blank. So she measured her options, her needs. She needed to warn someone. Someone at the Vatican needed to take her seriously. But who? The camera lingo? How? She was in a glass box with one exit. Tools, she told herself. There are always tools. Reevaluate your environment. Instinctively, she lowered her shoulders, relaxed her eyes, and took three deep breaths into her lungs. She sensed her heart rate slow and her muscles soften. The chaotic panic in her mind dissolved. Okay, she thought. Let your mind be free. What makes this situation positive? What are my assets? The analytical mind of Vittoria Vetra, once calmed, was a powerful force. Within seconds, she realized their incarceration was actually their key to escape. I'm making a phone call, she said suddenly. Langdon looked up. I was about to suggest you call Kohler, but... Not Kohler. Someone else. Who? The camera lingo. Langdon looked totally lost. You're calling the Chamberlain? How? Olivetti said the camera lingo was in the Pope's office. Okay. You know the Pope's private number? No. But I'm not calling on my phone. She nodded to a high-tech phone system on Olivetti's desk. It was riddled with speed dial buttons. The head of security must have a direct line to the Pope's office. He also has a weight lifter with a gun planted six feet away. And we're locked in. I was actually aware of that. I mean the guard is locked out. This is Olivetti's private office. I doubt anyone else has a key. Langdon looked out at the guard. This is pretty thin glass, and that's a pretty big gun. What's he going to do? Shoot me for using the phone? Who the hell knows? This is a pretty strange place, and the way things are going. Either that, Vittoria said, or we can spend the next five hours and 48 minutes in Vatican prison. At least we'll have a front row seat when the antimatter goes off. Langdon paled. But the guard will get all of Eddie the second you pick up that phone. Besides, there are 20 buttons on there, and I don't see any identification. You going to try them all and hope to get lucky? Nope, she said, striding to the phone. Just one. Vittoria picked up the phone 
and press the top button. Number 1. I bet you one of those Illuminati US dollars you have in your pocket that this is the Pope's office. What else would take primary importance for a Swiss Guard commander? Langdon did not have time to respond. The guard outside the door started rapping on the glass with the butt of his gun. He motioned for her to set down the phone. Vittoria winked at him. The guard seemed to inflate with rage. Langdon moved away from the door and turned back to Vittoria. You damn well better be right, cause this guy does not look amused. Damn, she said, listening to the receiver. A recording. Recording? Langdon demanded. The Pope has an answering machine? It wasn't the Pope's office, Vittoria said, hanging up. It was the damn weekly menu for the Vatican Commissary. Langdon offered a weak smile to the guard outside, who was now glaring angrily through the glass while he hailed Olivetti on his walkie-talkie. Chapter 38 The Vatican switchboard is located in the Officio di Comunicazione behind the Vatican Post Office. It is a relatively small room containing an 8-line Caracca 141 switchboard. The office handles over 2,000 calls a day, most routed automatically to the recording information system. Tonight, the sole communications operator on duty sat quietly sipping a cup of caffeinated tea. He felt proud to be one of only a handful of employees still allowed inside Vatican City tonight. Of course, the honor was tainted somewhat by the presence of the Swiss guards hovering outside his door. An escort to the bathroom, the operator thought. Ah, the indignities we endure in the name of Holy Conclave. Fortunately, the calls this evening had been light. Or maybe it was not so fortunate, he thought. World interest in Vatican events seemed to have dwindled in the last few years. The number of press calls had thinned and even the crazies weren't calling as often. The press office had hoped tonight's event would have more of a festive buzz about it. Sadly, though, despite ST, Peter's Square being filled with press trucks, the vans looked to be mostly standard Italian and Euro press. Only a handful of global coverall networks were there, no doubt having sent their journalisti secondari. The operator gripped his mug and wondered how long tonight would last. Midnight or so, he guessed. Nowadays, most insiders already knew who was favored to become Pope well before Conclave convened, so the process was more of a three- or four-hour ritual than an actual election. Of course, last-minute dissension in the ranks could prolong the ceremony through dawn, or beyond. The Conclave of 1831 had lasted 54 days. Not tonight, he told himself. Rumor was this conclave would be a smoke watch. The operator's thoughts evaporated with the buzz of an inside line on his switchboard. He looked at the blinking red light and scratched his head. That's odd, he thought. The zero line. Who on the inside would be calling operator information tonight? Who is even inside? Citadel del Vaticano Preco, he said picking up the phone. The voice on the line spoke in rapid Italian. The operator vaguely recognized the accent as that common to Swiss guards, fluent Italian tainted by the Franco-Swiss influence. This caller, however, was most definitely not Swiss guard. On hearing the woman's voice, the operator stood suddenly, almost spilling his tea. He shot a look back down at the line. He had not been mistaken. An internal extension. The call was from the inside. There must be some mistake, he thought. A woman inside Vatican City? Tonight? The woman was speaking fast and furiously. The operator had spent enough years on the phones to know when he was dealing with a Pazzo. This woman did not sound crazy. She was urgent but rational. Calm and efficient. He listened to her request, bewildered. I off camera lingo, the operator said, still trying to figure out where the hell the call was coming from. I cannot possibly connect. Yes, I am aware he is in the Pope's office, but who are you again, 
and you want to warn him of. He listened, more and more unnerved. Everyone is in danger. How? And where are you calling from? Perhaps I should contact the Swiss. The operator stopped short. You say you're where? Where? He listened in shock, then made a decision. Hold, please, he said, putting the woman on hold before she could respond. Then he called Commander Olivetti's direct line. There is no way that woman is really. The line picked up instantly. Per l'amour di Dio, a familiar woman's voice shouted at him. Place the damn call. The door of the Swiss Guard Security Center hissed open. The guards parted as Commander Olivetti entered the room like a rocket. Turning the corner to his office, Olivetti confirmed what his guard on the walkie-talkie had just told him. Vittoria Vetra was standing at his desk talking on the commander's private telephone. J. Codleone Cheha Questa, he thought. The ball's on this one. Livid, he strode to the door and ran the key into the lock. He pulled open the door and demanded, What are you doing? Vittoria ignored him. Yes, she was saying into the phone. And I must warn. Olivetti ripped the receiver from her hand and raised it to his ear. Who the hell is this? For the tiniest of an instant, Olivetti's inelastic posture slumped. Yes, Camerlingo, he said. Correct, Signore, but questions of security. Demand? Of course not. I am holding her here for, certainly, but... He listened. Yes, sir, he said finally. I will bring them up immediately. Chapter 39 The Apostolic Palace is a conglomeration of buildings located near the Sistine Chapel in the northeast corner of Vatican City. With a commanding view of St. Peter's Square, the palace houses both the papal apartments and the office of the Pope. Vittoria and Langdon followed in silence as Commander Olivetti led them down a long Rococo corridor, the muscles in his neck pulsing with rage. After climbing three sets of stairs, they entered a wide, dimly lit hallway. Langdon could not believe the artwork on the walls, mint condition busts, tapestries, friezes, works worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Two-thirds of the way down the hall, they passed an alabaster fountain. Olivetti turned left into an alcove and strode to one of the largest doors Langdon had ever seen. Officio di Papa, the commander declared, giving Vittoria an acrimonious scowl. Vittoria didn't flinch. She reached over Olivetti and knocked loudly on the door. Office of the Pope, Langdon thought, having difficulty fathoming that he was standing outside one of the most sacred rooms in all of world religion. Avanti! Someone called from within. When the door opened, Langdon had to shield his eyes. The sunlight was blinding. Slowly, the image before him came into focus. The office of the Pope seemed more of a ballroom than an office. Red marble floors sprawled out in all directions to walls adorned with vivid frescoes. A colossal chandelier hung overhead, beyond which a bank of arched windows offered a stunning panorama of the sun-drenched St. Peter's Square. My God, Langdon thought. This is a room with a view. At the far end of the hall, at a carved desk, a man sat writing furiously. Avanti, he called out again, setting down his pen and waving them over. Olivetti led the way, his gait military. Signore, he said apologetically. No ho patuto. The man cut him off. He stood and studied his two visitors. The camera lingo was nothing like the images of frail, beatific old men Langdon usually imagined roaming the Vatican. He wore no rosary beads or pendants, no heavy robes. He was dressed instead in a simple black cassock that seemed to amplify the solidity of his substantial frame. He looked to be in his late thirties, indeed a child by Vatican standards. He had a surprisingly handsome face a swirl of coarse brown hair, and almost radiant green eyes 
that shone as if they were somehow fueled by the mysteries of the universe. As the man drew nearer, though, Langdon saw in his eyes a profound exhaustion, like a soul who had been through the toughest fifteen days of his life. I am Carlo Ventresca, he said, his English perfect. The late Pope's camera lingo. His voice was unpretentious and kind, with only the slightest hint of Italian inflection. Vittoria Vetra, she said, stepping forward and offering her hand. Thank you for seeing us. Olivetti twitched as the camera lingo shook Vittoria's hand. This is Robert Langdon, Vittoria said, a religious historian from Harvard University. Padre, Langdon said in his best Italian accent. He bowed his head as he extended his hand. No, no, the camera lingo insisted, lifting Langdon back up. His holiness's office does not make me holy. I am merely a priest, a chamberlain serving in a time of need. Langdon stood upright. Please, the camera lingo said. Everyone sit. He arranged some chairs around his desk. Langdon and Vittoria sat. Olivetti apparently preferred to stand. The camera lingo seated himself at the desk, folded his hands, sighed, and eyed his visitors. Signore, Olivetti said, the woman's attire is my fault. I... Her attire is not what concerns me, the camera lingo replied, sounding too exhausted to be bothered. When the Vatican operator calls me a half hour before I begin conclave to tell me a woman is calling from your private office to warn me of some sort of major security threat of which I have not been informed, that concerns me. Olivetti stood rigid, his back arched like a soldier under intense inspection. Langdon felt hypnotized by the camera lingo's presence. Young and wearied as he was, the priest had the air of some mythical hero radiating charisma and authority. Signore, Olivetti said, his tone apologetic but still unyielding. You should not concern yourself with matters of security. You have other responsibilities. I am well aware of my other responsibilities. I am also aware that as director intermediario, I have a responsibility for the safety and well-being of everyone at this conclave. What is going on here? I have the situation under control. Apparently not. Father! Langdon interrupted, taking out the crumpled fax and handing it to the camera lingo. Please! Commander Olivetti stepped forward, trying to intervene. Father, please do not trouble your thoughts with... The camera lingo took the fax, ignoring Olivetti for a long moment. He looked at the image of the murdered Leonardo Vetra and drew a startled breath. What is this? That is my father, Vittoria said, her voice wavering. He was a priest and a man of science. He was murdered last night. The camera lingo's face softened instantly. He looked up at her. My dear child, I'm so sorry. He crossed himself and looked again at the facts, his eyes seeming to pull with waves of abhorrence. Who would, and this burn on his? The camera lingo paused, squinting closer at the image. It says Illuminati, Langdon said. No doubt you are familiar with the name. An odd look came across the camera lingo's face. I have heard the name, yes, but... The Illuminati murdered Leonardo Vetra so they could steal a new technology he was. Signore, Olivetti interjected. This is absurd. The Illuminati? This is clearly some sort of elaborate hoax. The camera lingo seemed to ponder Olivetti's words. Then he turned and contemplated Langdon so fully that Langdon felt the air leave his lungs. Mr. Langdon, I have spent my life in the Catholic Church. I am familiar with the Illuminati lore and the legend of the brandings. And yet, I must warn you, I am a man of the present tense. Christianity has enough real enemies without resurrecting ghosts. The symbol is authentic, Langdon said, a little too defensively, he thought. He reached over and rotated the facts for the camera lingo. 
the camera lingo fell silent when he saw the symmetry. Even modern computers, Langdon added, have been unable to forge a symmetrical ambigram of this word. The camera lingo folded his hands and said nothing for a long time. The Illuminati are dead, he finally said. Long ago. That is historical fact. Langdon nodded. Yesterday, I would have agreed with you. Yesterday? Before today's chain of events. I believe the Illuminati have resurfaced to make good on an ancient pact. Forgive me. My history is rusty. What ancient pact is this? Langdon took a deep breath. The destruction of Vatican City. Destroy Vatican City? The camera lingo looked less frightened than confused. But that would be impossible. Vittoria shook her head. I'm afraid we have some more bad news. Chapter 40 Is this true? The camera lingo demanded, looking amazed as he turned from Vittoria to Olivetti. Signore, Olivetti assured. I'll admit there is some sort of device here. It is visible on one of our security monitors. But as for Ms. Vetra's claims as to the power of this substance, I cannot possibly. Wait a minute, the camera lingo said. You can see this thing? Yes, signore. On wireless camera number 86. Then why haven't you recovered it? The camera lingo's voice echoed anger now. Very difficult, signore. Olivetti stood straight as he explained the situation. The camera lingo listened, and Vittoria sensed his growing concern. Are you certain it is inside Vatican City? The camera lingo asked. Maybe someone took the camera out and is transmitting from somewhere else. Impossible, Olivetti said. Our external walls are shielded electronically to protect our internal communications. This signal can only be coming from the inside, or we would not be receiving it. And I assume, he said, that you are now looking for this missing camera with all available resources? Olivetti shook his head. No, signore. Locating the camera could take hundreds of man hours. We have a number of other security concerns at the moment, and with all due respect to Ms. Vetra, this droplet she talks about is very small. It could not possibly be as explosive as she claims. Vittoria's patience evaporated. That droplet is enough to level Vatican City. Did you even listen to a word I told you? Ma'am, Olivetti said, his voice like steel. My experience with explosives is extensive. Your experience is obsolete, she fired back, equally tough. Despite my attire, which I realize you find troublesome, I am a senior-level physicist at the world's most advanced subatomic research facility. I personally designed the antimatter trap that is keeping that sample from annihilating right now. And I am warning you that unless you find that canister in the next six hours, your guards will have nothing to protect for the next century but a big hole in the ground. All of it he wheeled to the camera lingo, his insect eyes flashing rage. Signore, I cannot in good conscience allow this to go any further. Your time is being wasted by pranksters. The Illuminati? A droplet that will destroy us all? Basta, the camera lingo declared. He spoke the word quietly, and yet it seemed to echo across the chamber. Then, there was silence. He continued in a whisper. Dangerous or not, Illuminati or no Illuminati, whatever this thing is, it most certainly should not be inside Vatican City, no less on the eve of the conclave. I want it found and removed. Organize a search immediately. Olivetti persisted. Signore, even if we used all the guards to search the complex, it could take days to find this camera. Also, after speaking to Ms. Vetra, I had one of my guards consult our most advanced ballistics guide for any mention of this substance called antimatter. I found no mention of it anywhere. Nothing. Pompous ass, Vittoria thought. A ballistics guide? Did you try an encyclopedia? Under A. Olivetti was still talking. 
Signore, if you are suggesting we make a naked eye search of the entirety of Vatican City, then I must object. Commander. The camera lingo's voice simmered with rage. May I remind you that when you address me, you are addressing this office. I realize you do not take my position seriously. Nonetheless, by law, I am in charge. If I am not mistaken, the cardinals are now safely within the Sistine Chapel, and your security concerns are at a minimum until the conclave breaks. I do not understand why you are hesitant to look for this device. If I did not know better, it would appear that you are causing this conclave intentional danger. Olivetti looked scornful. How dare you! I have served your Pope for twelve years, and the Pope before that for fourteen years. Since 1438, the Swiss Guard have. The walkie-talkie on Olivetti's belt squawked loudly, cutting him off. Commandante? Olivetti snatched it up and pressed the transmitter. Astio occupato. Cosa voi? Scusi, the Swiss guard on the radio said. Communications here. I thought you would want to be informed that we have received a bomb threat. Olivetti could not have looked less interested. So handle it. Run the usual trace and write it up. We did, sir, but the caller. The guard paused. I would not trouble you, Commander, except that he mentioned the substance you just asked me to research. Antimatter. Everyone in the room exchanged stunned looks. He mentioned what? Olivetti stammered. Antimatter, sir. While we were trying to run a trace, I did some additional research on his claim. The information on antimatter is, well, frankly, it's quite troubling. I thought you said the ballistics guide showed no mention of it. I found it online. Alleluia, Vittoria thought. The substance appears to be quite explosive, the guard said. It's hard to imagine this information is accurate, but it says here that pound for pound antimatter carries about a hundred times more payload than a nuclear warhead. All of it he slumped. It was like watching a mountain crumble. Victoria's feeling of triumph was erased by the look of horror on the camera lingo's face. Did you trace the call? Olivetti stammered. No luck. Cellular with heavy encryption. The SAT lines are interfused, so triangulation is out. The signature suggests he's somewhere in Rome, but there's really no way to trace him. Did he make demands? Olivetti said, his voice quiet. No, sir. Just warned us that there is antimatter hidden inside the complex. He seemed surprised I didn't know. Asked me if I'd seen it yet. You'd asked me about antimatter, so I decided to advise you. You did the right thing, Olivetti said. I'll be down in a minute. Alert me immediately if he calls back. There was a moment of silence on the walkie-talkie. The caller is still on the line, sir. Olivetti looked like he'd just been electrocuted. The line is open? Yes, sir. We've been trying to trace him for ten minutes, getting nothing but splayed ferreting. He must know we can't touch him, because he refuses to hang up until he speaks to the camera lingo. Patch him through, the camera lingo commanded. Now! Olivetti wheeled. Father, no. A trained Swiss guard negotiator is much better suited to handle this. Now! Olivetti gave the order. A moment later, the phone on Camerlingo Ventresca's desk began to ring. The Camerlingo rammed his finger down on the speakerphone button. Who in the name of God do you think you are? 